Mom, I'm sorry. I've been thinking I might need to drop out of college. I just can't afford it anymore. What do you mean? Shouldn't you be able to get by with $3,000 a month? Isn't why I send you enough? Wait, Mom, you've never sent me anything, have you? Her shocking words hit me like a punch. I was sure I'd been sending her money every month. There was only one explanation for this. Anger started to boil up within me. My name is Beatrix. I lost my husband early and have been raising my daughter Anita all by myself. Our life together has always been a stretch. I never had time or money to worry about my appearance. Did I look so miserable? Occasionally, my mother-in-law would look at me with disdain. Beatrix, can't you at least try to improve your stuff a little? Your hair, your clothes, you look well. A bit shabby. I'm sorry, I'll try to do better. It hurt to be criticized, but she was right. I had no choice but to accept her words. I never let myself get angry or snap back at her. In the spring of a certain year, my daughter Anita was accepted to her dream college. It was a far commute from home, so she decided to live on her own. Anita, I'll do my best to send you money, so you have to do your best to study. Don't push yourself too hard. Remember, your health comes first. Mom, that's my line. I'll work part-time too. Don't worry about sending you money. Her thoughtful words filled my heart. Anita had grown up to be such a kind child, even though our life had been tough compared to her friends and other families. I wanted to support Anita and make her college life as fulfilling as possible. I didn't want her to worry about money, so I worked harder than ever before. $3,000 a month, that was my goal. If I could send her that much, she wouldn't have to work a part-time job. My mother-in-law noticed my efforts and spoke to me. So you're sending money to Anita. Can you really afford it? I hope it doesn't mean less for us. You know we rely on your support. I had always been grateful to my father-in-law when he was alive, and after his death, I continued to support my in-laws out of gratitude. Don't worry, I've taken on more jobs, so I'll still be able to give you your share. Oh, I see. That's fine then. After losing my husband, my income was unstable, and I guess my mother-in-law was worried. I understood her concern, so I never thought about reducing my contribution to my in-laws. Supporting my in-laws and sending money to Anita, it was more than $3,000 in total. Still, I managed to send it all, even if it meant cutting back on my own food and clothing expenses. Working all day and night was tough, but the messages from Anita always encouraged me. Mom, I've made friends. Mom, there's this weird professor, but the class is so interesting. Mom, I didn't do well in class today and got scolded, but I'll keep trying. Reading such innocent messages from Anita, I could sense she was enjoying her college life. Any exhaustion I felt just blew away. I felt proud of myself, believing that my hard work was for her happiness. But over time, messages from Anita became less and less frequent. A few months later, her cheerful messages had stopped completely. Whenever I reached out with worry, she would only respond with a short, I'm okay. Could it be that she was having so much fun at college that she had forgotten about her mother? Or maybe she had found a boyfriend and was focusing only on him? One day, when I was brooding over such thoughts, suddenly my phone rang. It was Anita. Hello, Anita. What's up? You called suddenly. It was unusual for her to call. Maybe it was because we always have face-to-face -face conversations at home. But Anita rarely called, even after she started living alone in college. Most of her contact with me was through text messages. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mom. What happened? Is there something wrong? Anita sounded down. I could tell something was wrong, so I focused on her voice coming from my smartphone. I, I ran out of money. I'm thinking maybe I should quit college. What? Anita's words were so unexpected that I couldn't help raising my voice. What do you mean you're out of money? I'm sorry. I tried my best. Anita's voice was trembling as if she was about to cry. I had been sending her $3,000 every month without fail. It wasn't enough for luxury, but she shouldn't be struggling to the point of having to quit college. She was also supposed to be working part-time. I never imagined that she would say she was out of money. Could she have gotten involved with some bad friends and skip studying to spend all her money? I thought about it for a moment, then shook my head. That's not like Anita. Anita, it's okay. Take a deep breath and tell me what happened. Yeah, I was trying to make ends meet with rent, 
groceries, and what I made from my part-time job. I had to dip into my savings and now that's all gone too. I'm sorry, Mom. I'm really sorry. Hold on a second. What about the money I send you every month? That should cover your rent and living expenses, right? No matter how I thought about it, the math didn't add up. If Anita was spending her salary and my remittances and even had to touch her savings, something was seriously wrong. But from her tone, she didn't seem to be lying. When I asked her, Anita seemed confused. Mom, you never sent me any money, did you? What did you just say? Anita's words were so shocking that I found myself shouting again. That's impossible. I've been sending you $3,000 every month. Did you check properly? Are you sure there's no money in your account? There's nothing. I've been keeping a close eye on my banking card. If you'd sent me that much money, I definitely would have noticed. The shock hit me like a punch to the head, making me feel dizzy. It was clear that Anita hadn't been receiving the money, and it was causing her a lot of trouble. You don't need to drop out of college. I'll send the money right away, so don't worry. Do you have something to eat today? Are you okay? You're not getting sick, are you? I'm fine. I switched to a job where I get meals and my friends have been worried about me. They've been sharing some food with me. That's great. You have good friends. We need to thank them next time. But mom, you're already having a hard time. I don't want you to struggle anymore because of me. So that's why you didn't tell me until the situation got this critical. Thank you. But listen, seeing you in such a difficult situation is much worse. So please leave the rest to me. With that, Anita finally let out her emotions and started crying. I wondered when was the last time I heard her cry like this. After comforting Anita and hanging up the phone, I immediately took action. Driven by growing anger, I decided to confront my mother-in-law, who lived nearby. Oh my, what's the matter, Beatrix? Showing up without a call? How rude. Never mind that. What have you been doing with the money I've been giving you each month? Eh? What? That money is for living expenses. As soon as I mentioned the money, I noticed my mother-in-law's face twitch for a moment. I'm talking about the money for Anita. I was giving that to you too, right? The remittance to Anita was not directly transferred by me into her account. I've been handing it directly to my mother-in-law, who offered to make the transfer herself when she learned it was for Anita. So I have been giving you an additional $3,000 for Anita's remittance. I would have declined if it was only about transferring the money, but there was a reason I didn't. That's because she said, I want to contribute to my granddaughter too. That's what you said, right? I trusted you and gave you the money, but what do you mean you didn't transfer it? My mother-in-law had convinced me with that. Even though she was getting money from me, I thought it was her kindness toward Anita and trusted her. What are you talking about? I've been transferring money to Anita's account every month. Yes, I have. Please stop lying so blatantly. Anita has told me that she never received any transfers. Oh my, for her to lie like that, what kind of child is she? Beatrix, maybe it's your parenting that's the problem. Excuse me? Hearing my own daughter being called a liar made me feel a rush of blood to my head. But if I lost my temper and forgot myself here, it would play right into her hands. I told myself to calm down, took a deep breath, and spoke again. Anita doesn't lie. If you insist on this, show me the bank statements where you made the transfers. I threw those away a long time ago. Listen, by checking Anita's account history, it's easy to see whether you really transferred the money or not. Even after knowing this, are you still going to call Anita a liar? Anyone could think of this, but when I said this, my mother-in-law seemed at a loss for words. She huffed again muttering stubbornly under her breath. So persistent. I took a deep breath and said, If you insist that you transferred the money, we should let the police investigate. What? The police? The mention of the police made her previously defiant face turn pale. The police? Isn't that a bit dramatic? It's not. This is about money. You said you transferred it, but it didn't show up. That sounds like a crime to me. We need to get it properly investigated. I, I don't think we need to go that far. Well, then I'll contact them now. No, stop. I, I was wrong. As I pretended to call the police, she lunged to snatch the phone from my hands. She missed and stumbled, then fell down and started crying. I never expected the mere mention of the police to have such an effect. In reality, I wasn't sure if the police would do anything in a situation like this where it was obvious that a family member was involved. 
but the word police itself seemed to weigh heavily on her. Despite her sobbing, I felt nothing. Anita, who had tried so hard not to cry, was the one who had suffered. According to her subsequent confession, she had always loved shopping. She probably had a shopping addiction, although she didn't seem to realize it. She told me tearfully about how her husband had once cut up her credit cards and how difficult it was for her. As far as I can tell, it was entirely her own doing, but she didn't seem to understand that. I suspected something was off. My mother-in-law kept getting the same amount of money even after he passed away, but I started getting requests for money earlier than expected. That never happened when he was around because he never gave me any money. When I went grocery shopping, he would check all the receipts and I had to return every cent of the change. Can you believe that? It was awful. I felt so pitiful. I couldn't begin to understand what she thought was pitiful and didn't bother trying. In other words, when her husband was alive, he managed the household finances and kept her from having any extra money. When he was gone, I finally had some money. I started buying things I couldn't afford before, and well, I fell a little short. Then you mentioned sending money to Anita. So you took Anita's money. Do you realize that's theft? Theft? That sounds so awful. I was just borrowing it. Borrowing it with no intention of returning it? Anita suffered because of your selfishness. She's young. She can handle it. Caught off guard by her incomprehensible retort, I was at a loss for words. I've been deprived for so long. I couldn't buy anything I wanted, couldn't even go out to eat or travel. I had such a hard life. Young people can work and play as much as they want, so why shouldn't I take some money? I stood there speechless, staring at my mother-in-law as she cried and screamed. All I could think was that I had trusted this person. My father-in-law had done me many favors, but now that I think about it, I can't recall my mother-in-law ever being kind to me. However, when Anita was still a little girl, my mother-in-law did buy her various things, so I thought she was expressing affection for Anita in her own way, and I was relieved. Looking back, I suspect all that shopping was just to satisfy her own desires. I failed to see that and caused Anita unnecessary suffering. Such a gentle child. I can never regret it enough. Mother-in-law, no, Evelyn. I intentionally called her by her first name. I didn't want to think of her as my mother, even if it was just in law. I cannot forgive you. After that, I sought free legal advice and did everything I could to recover the money, but you can't take from a person who has nothing. However, I had a trump card. Before my father-in-law passed away, he left me a will giving me the rights to his property. At that time, I wondered why he left it to me, but now I guess he might have been worried about his wife's reckless behavior. Naturally, my mother-in-law demanded that I renounce the inheritance but I firmly refused. I want to praise my past self for standing firm despite being severely criticized as a greedy daughter-in-law. No matter what they say, I felt that I couldn't disregard my father-in-law's feelings. I didn't know the reason or the circumstances, but maybe I felt something. So technically, the house and the land are mine, and my mother-in-law is just living there rent-free. I decided to sell the house. That meant the parasitic mother-in-law living there was in the way, so I contacted her parents. This contact information was secretly given to me by my father-in-law, just in case. I really admire his foresight. That's why it's such a shame he didn't have a good eye for women. I knew that my mother-in-law had always hated her own family, but the reason became clear when I contacted them. They were a traditional farming family with strong tendencies toward male chauvinism. A stranger like me called, and they listened with a suspicious attitude, but they gladly agreed to take in my mother-in-law. It seemed like they wanted free labor. The conversation progressed quickly, and one day, out of the blue, her family came to pick her up, an event that my mother-in-law couldn't have predicted. I'll never forget the color draining from her face when I took her brother, who came to pick her up, to her house. Now, my mother-in-law is doing tough farm work under strict supervision. She can't even go shopping at the supermarket, let alone squander money, and she seems to be living a life without touching money at all. Due to the stress, she seems to have aged quickly and is working every day as a wrinkled, frail, ghost-like figure with white hair. Looking at the recent bank statement of the money I just transferred to Anita, I smiled, thinking that if I saw her at night, I might scream. The house sold easily. It wasn't in a particularly good location, but once I decided I was okay with selling it for a low price, a buyer came forward immediately. 
The amount was enough to recoup the money wasted by my mother-in-law. I use that money without hesitation for my living expenses, and I send Anita the money I earn from working. It's all money, but somehow the money I got from selling the house feels tainted, and I didn't like that. I've transferred this month's money just now. With that thought, I quickly texted Anita. Even if I hadn't transferred the money, as long as I had communicated that I had sent it to Anita, she wouldn't have discovered the mistake so late. I regret now for neglecting such simple communication due to my busy schedule. The reply came swiftly. Got it. The message, full of Anita's usual energy, was accompanied by a string of cute emojis. She checked so quickly. But these days, it seems you can easily check your bank balance on your mobile phone. I don't understand it at all, so I can only admire the adaptability of the young. Since then, Anita started sending messages frequently again. With the money reliably reaching her, her life must have become stable. It's clear from her texts that she's energetically continuing college without quitting. While I was feeling pleased, another message arrived from Anita. Looking at it, my eyes widened and I broke into a grin. Mom, there's someone I want you to meet. I didn't expect this day to come. It was all worth it. I can't sit around. I need to prepare something good. I changed my plan and headed to a high-end supermarket I don't usually go to. Since I no longer have to send money to my mother-in-law, there's a bit more wiggle room in my life. I've even been able to quit a few of the jobs I was juggling. I wonder what kind of food my daughter's partner likes. With a bit of premature speculation, I laughed. In the near future, I plan to invite the fresh-faced couple to our home and treat them with the best hospitality I can muster.